Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's MFA Fine Arts Talk featuring Ellen Harvey, an artist who was born in England and lives in New York, Brooklyn, to be precise. As you're about to see, her work is simultaneously traditional in terms of the ways she makes images, particularly when she paints, um, and also conceptual in terms of the conceptual <laughs> strategies that motivate her projects. Her work is simultaneously traditional in terms of the ways she makes images and also conceptual uh, in terms of the conceptual strategies that motivate her project. Uh, her work has been exhibited widely, including solo shows at Turner Contemporary in Margate, in Margate, excuse me, the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia, Locks Gallery in Philadelphia, the Suburban uh, in Milwaukee, that's Michelle Grabner's space, I think, right? Yeah, that's her space. Mm. Uh, the Gröninger uh, Museum in Bruges, the Corcoran Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. I think you showed there just before I did, right before, yeah. which was right before they closed, sadly. No, that was very sad. The Bass Museum in Miami Beach, Dodge Gallery, may it rest in peace, uh, in New York. Um, with my friend Jason Middlebrook, um, Gallery Magnus Müller in Berlin, Lux Gallery in New York, Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts in Philadelphia, the Center for Contemporary Art in Warsaw, and the Whitney Museum at Altria uh, in New York. Uh, Dickiara Stewart um, in uh, New York, um, and also at their, their upstate space I saw, and also Stefan Stux Gallery in New York. Ellen's current solo exhibition at the Museum der Moderne in Salzburg, Austria, runs through February 20th, 2022. So if you've been looking for an excuse to go to um, <laughs> Salzburg, it's not just about the Mozart Kugels this month and next month, it's also about seeing Ellen's show. Um, the list of group exhibitions that included Ellen's work runs to several pages on her resume, but some of the most notable are the 2008 Whitney Biennial, the 2000 Gwangju Biennial in Korea, PS1 Contemporary Art Center, um, back before uh, it took shelter under the protective wing of the Museum of Contemporary Art and became MoMA PS1, uh, Seattle Art Museum, and Art in General in New York. Ellen has completed numerous public art commissions, including um, at uh, San Francisco International Airport, Boston's South Station, that's the main train station in Boston, Miami Beach Convention Center, Philadelphia International Airport, University of California, San Francisco, which is the sort of flagship medical school in the Bay Area, uh, the Metro North Station at Yankee Stadium here in New York, and the MTA subway station at Queens Plaza. So um, you can see her work um, quite easily at Queens Plaza. Ellen has received many grants, awards, and residencies um, from esteemed and uh, organizations, including the Smithsonian Institution, the Guggenheim Foundation, uh, CEC Arts Link um, for a project in St. Petersburg, Art Production Fund for a project in Las Vegas, the Rima Hort Mann Foundation, Pew Charitable Trust, Algira in Newark, um, Lily Auchincloss Foundation and Art Oh My. Ellen is the author of New York Beautification Project, which is recently reissued in paperback. And her work has um, been the subject of several catalogs and dozens, many dozens of reviews and articles in journals, magazines, and newspapers. She is represented by Locks Gallery in Philadelphia, uh, Messen de Klerk, in Brussels and Gallery Gebruder Lehmann in Dresden, Germany. Her educational path is somewhat unusual um, compared to some of the ar other artists who've presented here. After receiving an undergraduate degree from Harvard College, uh, she attended Hochschule der Künste in Berlin uh, and then got a JD from Yale Law School before participating, <clears throat> participating in the Whitney uh, Independent Study Program. So think twice before you sue Ellen Harvey, and please join <laughs> me in welcoming her 
to um, to SBA tonight. Welcome. All right. Well, thank you so much for that incredibly lengthy introduction. Um, I think I need to cut down my my CV massively. It's just greatest highlights from now on. Um, I'm going to start by um, talking a tiny bit about what motivates me as an artist and perhaps because I came to it from a slightly sort of circuitous route. Um, one of the things that's always puzzled me is this sort of question of like, of how do you become an artist? It's not an obvious thing. It's not like becoming a doctor or becoming a lawyer. There's nothing that can make you into an artist. It's something that you have to claim for yourself. And yet at the same time, it's an essential thing. You have to actually persuade other people that you are an artist. Um, there are lots of gatekeepers. There are institutions that need that uh, need to give you a sort of good housekeeping stamp of approval. Um, there are questions. There are sort of questions of other sort of gatekeepers, like who's a Sunday artist, who's a serious artist, who's a hobbyist. Um, and I've always found myself fascinated by these sort of liminal social spaces, um, which, where things are either art or not art, where they can tip both ways. And I've also always found myself interested in the kind of institutions that demarcate the social space of art in our community. Because if you think about it, it's very artificial. There could be somebody else who, you know, there could be some other category of people who are allowed to do creative things who weren't called artists. Um, and I'm also really interested as a result in this question of like, what should an artist actually do? You know, it's one thing to decide that you want to be an artist, another thing to decide that you are an artist, another thing to have, you know, convince other people that you're an artist. But then once you are an artist, so to speak, what are you meant to do with that? What is the proper function of an artist in our society? And that, those are things that, that I've just been sort of circling around now for the past 20 years, and I don't have an answer, but um, I'm gonna show you a whole series of projects rather quickly, sort of the speed dating of, uh, of my, of my work um, to kind of discuss some of these sort of ways in which I use my work to explore those questions and to sort of play around with some of the answers or, or non-answers in many cases. So let me just share my screen. Right. That was the boring part, that was my name. So um, one of the reasons that I spent so much time thinking about what it was to be an artist was because I come out of a rather sort of traditional idea of being an artist. I come out of being a painter. Um, I was somebody who really was, you know, sort of in the studio painting and, and struggling a great deal with what to paint and why to paint and, but then one of these days, one day in sort of 1999, there was um, a call to do a project in Highbridge Park, which was um, and is a park on the Upper West Side, all the way up like 181st Street. And it's sort of in a bad, it's sort of at the time it had just been renovated by Bette Midler's um, New York restoration project. And it was, you know, the kind of park where they found like a, you know, a, a torso in a bag and where cars went to be stripped and people went to have sex in the bushes. And it was understandably not a very popular park with the local sort of um, community. And so there was this sort of moment where they decided that to you know, incite people to come into the park, they would rather misguidedly have a public art exhibition. I mean, of course it didn't work. People from the neighborhood did not go to the park. The only people who went to the park were the artists and the artists' friends. So as a kind of social um, uh, event, it was kind of a fiasco. But for me, it was actually incredibly important because it was the first time that I'd had the opportunity or been in a situation where I thought, I wonder what I could do outside of the studio. Like, what could I do that could be interesting outside of, um, you know, paint on canvas? And there was a lot of graffiti and you know I found this sort of big column tagged by ARD and I thought maybe let's just let's just paint on 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 a wall I can paint too so I thought what kind of tag would I have as a sort of white um English woman and I thought well what would be the sort of most ridiculous tag I could come up with and I thought well I'll just do a really bad version of a Claude Lorrain landscape since this after all is this kind of picturesque landscape that the park is aspiring to and I put it up, you know, while I was painting, there was some guy like masturbating in the bushes who came out and afterwards was like, how did you get this job? How much are they paying you? And I was like, 
you're not paying me anything. But um, he's like, man, you've got to get a better job. But at the time, um, there was this, mo there was this sort of, you know, it was the time when Giuliani was mayor and there was a massive crackdown on graffiti artists at the time. And a lot of it was about art versus vandalism, was a sort of public conversation. And yet at the same time, it was very obvious that the kind of people who were being arrested were people who didn't look that much like me. And I thought, you know, being a white woman in your thirties is probably the best possible demographic if you're going to go out and try and break the law in public. So I thought, you know, I should just become a graffiti artist for a bit. So I spent about two years um, painting small oval tags. They're all about like five by seven inches. Each one took about sort of generally two to three days to paint. Um, and they were very much an exploration for me about of like what kind of social consensus is there about what's art and what's graffiti. You know, when I was painting this one in the Bronx, like this guy came up and he was like, that's my brother's mural. Are you doing it with respect? And then he was like, but you're doing it all wrong. Where's your crew? You know, my brother has a dot com. You're never going to get anywhere like this. You know, I got beaten up by the police once women and they mistook me for a homeless person, but then they sort of turned me around and there was this moment of like, well, you're obviously not a homeless person. They decided to see if I had permission. Um, and then, you know, they came back and they were like, you can't have permission because the owner's dead. It's this sort of mad Kafka-esque moment where you think, oh, well, you know, I really can't win in this situation. And the whole project then ended up becoming this sort of, becoming this sort of trip through the city, listening to what people thought artists should be doing, what they thought of art. I mean, the idea was partly to have a kind of tag that was that represented this sort of white European painting tradition, but also that was like completely inoffensive. What's like, like utterly sort of, you know, it was impossible to be, there were no nudes, there was, it, it was just, there was just landscapes. And, you know, the project was really for me a success in the sense that it actually did create some kind of public discussion about who is allowed to be an artist in public space and what kind of things can be art. It was very interesting um, the way in which you make something that is sufficiently reactionary in appearance and suddenly the fact that it's illegal disappears or the fact that you look a certain way um, means that you can get away with breaking the law in broad daylight surrounded by people. Um, I made a map because of course all good public art projects have to have a map. And then it eventually became a book because in many ways, the most interesting thing about the project were not the paintings, which were I think pretty subpar as landscape paintings, but, um, but were the things that happened and the stories that people told me. Um, and now when the project is exhibited, you get to see the, um, the images, but then underneath, I always exhibit the stories of what happened in each of these places, and also the story of like, what happened with the project. So it's also a story of how a piece of art can become part of a larger public conversation. But so when it's, when it's exhibited, it's not only about the stories of what happened to me, but it's also about the story of what happened um, in terms of how the project was received and written about, um, and became known. And this, this, quest, this sort of, this project ended up inspiring a whole number of pieces um, where I started sort of inhabiting these sort of non-artist um, art practices. I was a portrait artist on a street for a while. I was doing free portraits of people. Um, in, in they had, all they had to do was fill out a form and then I would mail them the finished 15 minute portraits. Again, I'm not a tremendously good um, portrait artist. So um, most of my forms were filled with nothing but complaints. Um, like this gentleman whose hair, I need a haircut, nose, sorry, I'm Jewish, I can't help it. Eyes, they're blue for all the ladies out there. Eyebrows, Adonis comes to mind. He was sort of the original metrosexual. Um, or this lady who was like, you know, I have, um, my portrait looks good. I wonder if I could get a left eyebrow. Thanks, Ellen. Um, I did the project later inside the um, Whitney as part of the Whitney Biennial. And at that point, interestingly enough, um, instead of being filled with complaints, all of the evaluations of the portraits were about me. So they tended to be all about how wonderful it was to meet me and what a pleasure it had been to spend time with me. I don't think I got any better during the time. It was a really interesting experience to sort of see how um, differently 
an artwork can be experienced depending on the context. And this question of who is an artist is one that of course, as an artist automatically means that you are, you see yourself as part of the canon. You see yourself as part of um, a larger history of art because otherwise you wouldn't call yourself an artist, you would call yourself something else. And I was asked to make a project for the um, Whitney Museum's um, Altria space, which was in, um, in the Philip Morris building, part of this sort of slightly mad um, project that the Whitney had, where they had these sort of strange spaces outside of the museum. And I felt that it was really too bad for, the, for Philip Morris. You know, they'd paid all this money, they'd supported the museum, and they were getting some artists that nobody had ever heard of. I mean, they'd obviously much, much rather have some well-known artist. So I thought I would just give them the whole museum. At the time, the um, Whitney had just put out a catalog. Can you hear the music in the background here? I cannot. Awesome, because I can hear it, but I'm just, it's, it's next door. Um, and so I thought, well, I'll just make a Whitney for the Whitney at Philip Morris to celebrate their years of support and uh, evil doing. And so this, they had made a catalog and I thought, well, I'll just paint every single thing in the catalog and then we'll have the entire Whitney for the museum. Um, and this is the catalog in the middle all ripped apart and there were holes in the wall so that the artists who've been collected since the catalog came out, who I felt must have been rather disappointed, could be exhibited behind the walls. Um, and so here's some of the paintings, this sort of slightly sort of punk version of the Whitney Museum. And this question of, you know, so, so one of the ways, of course, in which you become an artist, you know, the, the sort of subtitle of um, the Whitney, the book's called American Visionaries, and the subtitle of my show was A Whitney for the Whitney at Philip Morris, American Visionaries, I Can Be an American Visionary Too. One way, of course, of becoming an artist is to be in the museum, which, of course, you want to be. But in my case, I couldn't be in it, so I just made it for myself. But another way is to sell things. And so I started thinking a lot about um, this sort of market and I was making paintings for quite a while for art fairs. I refused to make any paintings that weren't entitled wallpaper for the rich. And there would be these paintings of wallpaper hung on the wallpaper. They were tremendously unpopular. I still have several. Um, they were really, uh, made my poor gallerists very sad. And the same, so at the, the same time that um, I'm working on those, I also started thinking more and more about this question of, as an artist, how do you actually, you know, present yourself as an artist? And one of the things I thought about was this whole tradition of self-portraiture. And I thought in some ways, it's more honest just to not show yourself. So I like this idea. I started becoming obsessed with this idea that it was all, and I was a failure. So I was going to make, paint myself as a failure. I was going to show myself as a, um, as a Polaroid so that it's this sort of throwaway thing, but of course it's a painting. So again, you're sort of undercutting it. You're sort of showing painting as um, a low tech special effect, so to speak. And you can't see me because I'm hidden by the flash and all these paintings. Um, and there were all these things that I wanted to talk about in my work. And this is something that I think that most artists have felt at some point where you think, oh, you know, there's so many subjects in the world that I need to grapple with. And yet as an artist, is anything I do actually make any sense? Is there any point to this? And I thought um, I would make an entire museum um, dedicated to this question of um, failure. And this idea that as an artist, one of the things that connects you to other people is in fact failure. It's this desire for something extraordinary that you can never attain. And so I built my own tiny museum, um, which oh, disappeared, um, which is basically a hand engraved mirror with a hole in it. And And the, um, when you look through the hole, you could see a painting behind it. Um, it's illuminated from behind. It's all engraved by hand. And behind it is a painting that's um, identical to the, um, the museum, so to speak, in front, which is um, 
But in this case, you think, oh, on the, on the, on the outside, you get to see an entire um, museum. That's just the context. You don't see an actual um, exhibition. When you look through, you think there's going to be an actual subject matter. But then the subject matter is, of course, terribly disappointing. It's just me in my studio. You can see um, this is sort of the identical collection of frames painted in a trompe l'oeil fashion. And then you see me just sort of um, obliterated yet again by the flash wearing what looks like a traditional artist smock painting the panels that you're actually seeing. There's this way in which you hope that the artist is going to say something profound. And then in the end, all you get to see is the artist by themselves sort of working in their studio. And I thought that this, and this is a sort of question of failure and things that don't work, just ended up inspiring a whole series, I think to this very day of work. Um, I, made, I made another room in the Museum of Failure. These were, these were pieces that were called um, the Room of Sublime Wallpaper. And they were about this idea of paintings that you couldn't have from the outside. They're rooms that look like they have these sort of collections of landscape paintings. But when you go inside, you realize they're all angled mirrors that are just reflecting the, um, the walls on the outside. Um, yeah, there are two different versions of this piece. And the piece is also about this idea of tourism and of arriving at a beautiful place, seeing it, and then um, wanting to keep it, wanting to hold on to it. And then, of course, the moment you enter the room, all you see is yourself. You stop seeing the paintings. It was also made originally for um, an art fair in the, with the idea that they were paintings that you couldn't actually purchase. Um, the same way that these paintings are paint called souvenirs of Armageddon, and they're very much about this idea that you know, a painting traditionally was a souvenir of a beautiful place, but these are souvenirs of catastrophes. And of course, they're not even real souvenirs because they're painted to look like Polaroids, but they're not in fact Polaroids. Apart from this, this sort of obsession with the market and this idea that you can't actually own, and that, you know, that making work that you can't own or you can't sell, or that's very difficult to own and sell. Um, I was also really interested in the idea of art as some kind of public service. What if you make artwork to actually create things that people want? Um, this was a project that was made for um, the Center of Contemporary Art in New Orleans after Katrina um, for a show that was invited, artists had been invited to work with debris to um, create artworks. And I just felt that personally, I just couldn't quite do that. I kept on thinking, what if it was my life? It was my debris. I would just be so, I don't know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel good about seeing it made into an artwork, I thought. So instead I put an advertisement in the Times Picayune and asked people to um, send me images or descriptions of things that they had lost that um, were irreplaceable. So the project is called The Irreplaceable Cannot Be Replaced. And um, so this is somebody's house. This is Grace's house. I printed also the texts. And at the end of the show, I gave away all the paintings to the participants. Um, these are the, um, some of these tools. Um, I didn't manage to paint every single one. Some people, I just only had time to print the um, stories and then they got the stories. Of course, being an artist is not just about trying to do the right thing or trying to do something to help other people. In some ways, it's also a tremendously hedonistic decision. And this is a piece that very much celebrates this um, sort of love that I've always had for museums since I was a very small child. And one of the reasons I loved museums was because they were sexy. It's the only place you could go where you could actually see naked people in, you know, 19... 70s and 1980s England. So um, this is called the Nudist Museum, and these are paintings of all of the um, nudes in the Bass Museum's permanent collection. And they're hung over a sort of backdrop of um, porn and fitness magazines, sort of contemporary nudes. So you get to see all these art nudes, most of which, many of which, in fact, are the baby Jesus, who's almost always sort of in the all together, swanning about. Um, here he is. And uh, behind him, you get to see this sort of very sort of, in a way, simplistic idea of the nude that we have today, which is so highly sexualized. So I was interested in this idea that 
you know, the nudes that you encounter in a museum might actually be in some ways um, more varied and more interesting than the ones that we encounter in life today. The museum also had a little exhibition. So you have the two great nude archetypes battling it out, Venus versus Sebastian, gay, straight, pagan, Christian, male, female, um, masochist, sadist. Of course, Venus is winning. She's the one holding the arrow in this case. Whereas poor Sebastian is just a human pincushion. Um, and of course, every museum has to have a gift shop. So this was the gift shop for the nudist museum. Here we have the mug department with some rather lovely mugs. These are all paintings of objects that were found on eBay by Googling, typing in nude and taking out everything that was an actual artwork and then painting the other things. So I had nude lampshades, I had nude knives, um, in this case, nude mugs. So the sort of logical extension of a museum that is you know, sexy and attractive and um, makes you want to go there for many artists is a museum about yourself. And one of the most interesting examples of this is um, William Turner, the famous English painter who kept to starting at age, I think 28, um, built a gallery devoted to himself. He kept it until he died, by which time it was you know, famously decrepit and full of cats. But um, this is him actually um, painted, painted by George Jones in 1851 in his coffin, in his gallery. Um, so he had his wake um, in his gallery, all his, all his friends looking at dead Turner, surrounded by what he considered to be his masterworks, which he left rather ambitiously to the nation. Um, it took them about 150 years to actually figure out how to exhibit them all in the Turner wing at the Tate. Um, but he built this, he built this whole gallery about himself. And I, and I was invited to make um, a project for the Turner Contemporary, which is a new museum that was built in, I think, 2011, rather fetishistically on the site where Margate, where Turner had lived in Margate in sin with his landlady. Um, all of his uh, relationships seem to have been with landladies. He was quite the practical cat. And uh, he, you know, always claimed that Margate was particularly beautiful, but nowadays Margate, it's a little bit like Coney Island. It, it was a um, famous working class resort um, and now is very much down at the heels. And when they were building this museum, I did a lot of you know, research in the neighborhood. And one of the big anxieties was that people would come from London. It's about an hour and a half under the train. They would go to Margate, they'd go to the gallery, and then they would immediately leave. So I thought, well, I'll just make a version of, the gal of Turner's gallery. So you go to the new Turner contemporary, then you have to go inside the old Turner gallery. And then the old Turner gallery, instead of being all of Turner's greatest hits, is actually a, um, a panorama of Margate the way it looks today. On the outside, it says Arcadia. So it's sort of playing with this idea of being sort of bastard love child of an amusement arcade and, um, and an Arcadian site or a beautiful site. This idea that people come um, to see an, a beautiful place and then we, we, we mess it up by basically building amusement sites all over it. These are all mirrors again. These are all engraved by hand by me. And um, they basically sort of reinsert the Margate of today into the aesthetics of the engravings of Turner's time, which is how most people would have known his work at that point. Here you see the new museum. Um, here's somebody standing in front of it. As you can see, most of Margate at that point was sort of shuttered. Um, there's sort of bits of the sort of, of the sort of splendid old Victorian architecture still around, and then some sort of much less exciting bits as well. This is um, Arlington House. And this, this idea that um, a museum can be, you know, doesn't have to be a museum, this idea that you can build your own institution, that you can create an institution that can be portable, that can go somewhere, it meant that when I came to um, Washington DC and was invited to do a project at the Corcoran, and I saw this wonderful object in front of me, I just couldn't resist. I thought, this is it, this is the answer to my prayers. This is how painting should be displayed. Um, if only there were more paintings just roaming the streets of the world, um, like this beautiful hand-painted hot dog stand. 
And I was talking with the curator and I very much wanted to make a project that was about the built environment of Washington DC, because I found it so fascinating. You can see here behind the hot dog stand, you can see these typical buildings with all the columns. I mean, all of Washington DC just looks like a sort of mad wedding cake. And, and I said, you know, it's so strange, it's all the same. Like, why does it all look like this? And she was in the you know, curator said, well, it's, you know, Ellen symbolizes democracy. And I thought, well, I grew up in the UK. So for me, this kind of architecture when I was a kid symbolized the British empire. And then later, of course, the Roman empire. And then you have the Catholic church and Stalin built things like this. And the fascists love this kind of architecture. There are Jewish synagogues that look like this. Um, and I thought it's really interesting, this idea that all this different meaning can be attached to a particular style of building. So I thought what would be the most peculiar group of people who could become fans of classical and neoclassical architecture? And so I imagined aliens coming to the earth, you know, after we've rendered our planet a desolate wasteland, the aliens come, they're super nice aliens, they're mainly interested in swimming and flirting. And they've come to sort of visit Washington DC because they're very fond of neoclassical architecture, which they think perfectly represents their core values of swimming and flirting. Um, here is a souvenir stand with lots of hand painted souvenirs because they're my aliens and they really like paintings. Um, and this is the back of the souvenir stand. And uh, here's a little detail of the souvenir stand. And there was a, um, a map, of course, because I love maps. This is a map um, and a, a guide for aliens um, visiting New York City, visiting Washington DC. And they come up with all these explanations of what are quite um, well-known sites in Washington DC. Um, they're pretty sure that, um, you know, we were telepathic. The reason that all the pillars are the same and the lost pillar builders of earth is because we were telepathic. Um, we were radically egalitarian society. We all probably lived in the ocean, swam upstream once a year to have sex and build pillars together in perfect harmony. Um, this very useful map was on the other side. And wherever there were, we printed like, you know, about 20,000 of these. So wherever there were um, these guides in, um, Washington DC, we had the aliens guide. And it was also partly inspired as somebody, you know, who's emigrated to the States. I was a resident alien for a very long time before I became a citizen. And I'd always, I, I could never get out of my mind this um, conflation of, you know, alien extraterrestrial with alien um, immigrant. And I also remembered once hearing this um, very sad story on NPR about somebody finding a backpack in the desert with a little um, fake green card, with a little picture of a little green man on it. So I like this idea that the aliens could be more than one kind of alien. And uh, the aliens also really like postcards. They find this sort of trove of um, several thousand postcards and they arrange it like with like, which means that you get to discover that um, Gorky where uh, Lenin died looks almost exactly like the White House, which is very strange. And as one of the things that's also sort of then started to really fascinate me was this question of ruins and why a ruin is more artistic than an actually functioning building. Um, and I started to think, you know, part of my interest in failure has to do with this interest in what's useful and what's not useful. And I think that in some ways, you know, being a, making an artwork, it by definition, it has to be sort of useless. And so, so maybe that's why ruins are necessarily um, more artistic than um, functional buildings. So I got to make a project for the Internal Revenue Service in Andover, and they had just repurposed their building. So I made a big mirror that was engraved with um, a drawing of their space as if it had been abandoned and then had sort of gone back to nature and been reclaimed. So you can see all these abandoned computers and plants. And then I made um, marble sculptures for their courtyard, which were called fossils, and they're all fossilized computers. Um, I actually had to apologize to the IT department who felt that I was somehow um, dissing the uh, technological capabilities of the IRS when I made this project, but there we go. 
And then I got to actually make a real ruin because there's a church in um, outside of Brussels in Belgium that was abandoned. They weren't using it anymore and they had a competition. And I said, well, if you're going to knock it down anyway, why not just make something that everyone loves? Everyone loves a nice ruin. I mean, I grew up in the UK. There's nothing but ruins everywhere. And at the end of and this church was sort of interesting because at the it's partly because it's so boring. There are thousands and thousands of churches in Flanders that look exactly like this, because at the end of World War I, all of Flanders was flattened. So this is what the church looked like in 1918. And I thought, well, you know, now, you know, if it's, it's just, this goes to show how perverse humanity is. You know, you build it up, then you get, get rid of it again, and then you don't want it. So it's called repeat because there's a sort of endless cycle. So I got to actually make the church into a ruin. We took this, um, the roof off and everything inside pillars. And then I made a terrazzo floor that shows all the bits that are missing. So you can see sort of where the altar was. And then it has the shadow of the previous church, the way it looked at the end of um, World War I on the floor. And it's been quite a successful project actually, because now it's used by the local community. I did a lot of outreach beforehand and they wanted a public space and they don't have. So now it's used for parties. It's, there's, a whole, um, there's a whole music program there and uh, they're even building toilets in it now, which I think is the real mark of a successful public art project. And I've always enjoyed this idea that as an artist, one of your jobs is to create a more complicated conversation. We, we live in a world where a lot of the conversations are very simple. And I think that um, one of the things you can do as an artist is to try and make the conversation be less simple. <laughs> Just to add, you know, to add different things to your, to add different things to your conversation so that when you talk about something, you can both, you can also contradict yourself. And a lot of the projects that I've made, you know, resist a unitary meaning. And this project is probably one of the most um, sort of like that. This was made for the Gröninger Museum in Bruges. And Bruges, I don't know if any of you've seen that film in Bruges. It's, it's a famously beautiful uh, medieval town. And the reason it's so beautiful is because of a tragedy, really. It was a hugely successful port town in the 15th century. Its canal link to the ocean dried up and then it was abandoned. It was literally the definition of a backwater. And, um, but they, they actually owned the rights to uh, access to the sea. And so they, um, so about a hundred years ago, they built a new canal and now Bruges is actually attached to one of the largest car importing harbors in all of Europe. But nobody knows that. Everyone goes to Bruges to see the beautiful old medieval city. And so I was given this enfilade of rooms, this sort of series of rooms in the museum. And when you walked through it, what I did on one side, I had a painting um, in five parts with inlaid glass for all the waterways of the connection of the medieval city to the new um, to the new port. And on the other side, you could look into the um, storage area of the museum, the sort of museum depot. And I hung mirrors with openings and then you could see, I curated a series of um, paintings behind the mirrors. And as you walked along, on the one side, you would see, in this case, the sort of circular bit. Is, this is all my painting. It's about 10, it's about 10 feet high by um, almost 20 feet wide. And um, you can see the, um, the sort of Google Earth, the technological sublime is a detail of the painting. And on the other side, you could see the, um, the picturesque view or the sort of conventional painted view of the same place. This is what's behind the mirror, so you get to see. So and then you would walk along and then on the one hand you would go through the sort of to the contemporary port and on the other side you would go through to the old port which silted up so that the two ports would face each other at the end and then at the end you were in the ocean. And it was called the unloved because Bruges is a massively popular tourist attraction. So I thought the idea of calling Bruges the unloved seemed sort of pleasingly perverse. Also because in some ways what's loved is this sort of old fashioned picturesque sort of direct view. And this technological view is one that's not loved. It doesn't have the same emotional kind of connection for people. 
you know, speaking of uh, people who really built their own museums, one of the most interesting examples is, of course, um, Alfred, Dr. Alfred Barnes, who had the Barnes Foundation. He collected all these um, amazing modernist paintings, including a lot of Renoirs, um, a lot of naked ladies. He wrote about them all in terms of curves. He never mentions that they're nude ladies. And then he hung them with or interspersed with all these bits of metal work. And in his writings, he always talks about how the metal work is just as important as the paintings. And when he died, you know, it's the ultimate dead hand. He left this sort of crazy will where no one was allowed to change anything. When they had to move the museum, they actually had to fetishistically rebuild the whole thing. And I'd always been interested in this idea that maybe the metal work was just as good as, as the paintings. So I made the metal work into paintings. Um, I painted all 394 of them and they were on um, magnets so you could move them around. But of course, when we exhibited it at the Barnes Foundation, true to form, they wouldn't let anyone touch it. So that didn't quite work out the way I'd hoped. But I like this idea of thinking about artists and artisans and this question of like, what makes one more important than the other? Why are the applied arts, so to speak, not valued as highly, especially now when nobody really makes anything by hand except for artists? So I was interested when I met this guy in um, Bushwick who's still making handmade ornaments. I was like, so I started um, documenting all of his ornaments. Um, I made a whole bunch of ornaments. Um, this is a piece that was called Ornaments for the Subway. So they're all subway posters with um, these ornaments on top of them. And I was interested in this idea also of, is ornamentation inherently reactionary? Like what makes something reactionary? Like, you know, if you cover it with gold leaf, you know, and you have a palace. Is it, can, the, can the only people who live in there be people like Putin or the royal family or, or like Donald Trump in his sort of, you know, third rate Mar-a-Lago palace imitation? So this piece is called All That Glitter. And you can sort of see on the one side, you can see just mirrors. And then you can't actually, you can just sort of, you can visit the palaces, but you can't actually go inside them. And then the palaces have some of their uh, inhabitants. In the same way, these are two um, panels that are identical and one side this is called nostalgia one side is the original panel and the other one is gilded so that you have this kind of interrogation of which do you prefer the restored golden version or the actual old version um, this is a piece called um, mushroom landscape with mushroom clouds which are the is a found painting of a um, on a tree mushroom of a landscape and then these are of course some like mushroom clouds bringing it into the atomic age. In all of these cases, I think one of the things that's most interesting whenever you have an opportunity to work with a place is to, is to look and to say, well, which part of the story is intentionally missing? Which, what is, which stories do people need to have told? And so when I was asked to um, submit something for the Miami Beach Convention Center, I thought, you know, it has to be a piece about um, sea level rise and climate change, because obviously all of this is going to be underwater and it's constantly underwater anyway. So I proposed this piece that was originally rather euphemistically called um, Waterways and then became, of course, Atlantis, the underwater city. And it's a huge glass piece um, based on a painting that I made. Of, um, of this sort of diagonal slice of Florida going from the Everglades all the way to Miami Beach. And when you enter the Grand Ballroom, you go between this natural and this man-made landscape. And when the light hits it, then it looks like the whole thing is underwater. And this piece also exists as a painting um, because I made the painting first, then I made the glass version, and then I kept painting and the painting is called The Mermaid, Two Incompatible Systems Intimately Linked. And again, it's, it's a, well, you have the Miami Beach is the head of the mermaid and the Everglades are the tail. And here are some people inside the mermaid, which is quite large. And here's some details of the painting. It's a hundred feet long by 10 feet high. And it's quite, quite sort of madly detailed. I wanted it to be so detailed. I wanted to sort of, 
physically make people think about the scale of the problem. But it's also something that I think of as being a collective artwork. We're, we're all drawing together on the, um, on the surface of the ocean, of the world. And, and during this last year, there have been quite a lot of protests. I, I'm sure there's some of you gone to some of them. And I got a little tired of constantly making new protest signs. So I wanted to have some signs that could just go to whatever I was going to. So I made two, one of them, they're, they're oil paintings. One of them is the moon and the other one is the earth. So the earth likes to go to, is really quite self-centered and mainly goes to climate marches, but the moon is much more sort of interested in other things. So the moon is sort of goes to everything else. It has the sort of bigger picture overview. Um, this is this last, this, these last few pieces here are very recent. This is one that was made just, um, this, this last year for the exhibition at Turner Contemporary, and it's called On the Impossibility of Capturing a Sunset. And these are all hand engraved mirrors. And they, they basically about that idea that you know, you're trying to photograph something, you're trying to represent something and you're failing. You're constantly not able to capture something that's beautiful. So these are all you know, hand engraved to look like tablets or iPhones but they're in fact just engravings and they're all based on the same um, one photograph of a sunset um, at different, from different uh, kind of resolutions. And this is a piece that's the most recent piece, except for the last thing I'm gonna show you. And these are all, um, it's called the, there's a pan very famous panorama. I'm obsessed with panoramas, which are these you know, pre-cinematic, cinematic experiences. There were huge paintings made in the round. And there's one in Salzburg um, made by the, um, the Zattler family. And so I decided I'd make my version. It's called Selfie Panorama. And they're all paintings taken from the same place where Zattler painted his panorama in 1820. And, um, but in this case, there's a kind of selfie ghost in the middle. So when you, when you animate it, you kind of, you, you're turning around seeing the view today that uh, Zattler then painted back then. And the very last project I'm gonna talk about is the one that's ongoing. And this is one that you can all actually take part in if you're interested. It's called The Disappointed Tourist. And um, it started off by my making postcards and sending them out saying, is there a place that you've always wanted to visit or revisit that no longer exists? And then I started painting the uh, responses. And so there's a website now with all the stories of where people wanted, um, what, where what people, places that people would like to visit. And um, I've now painted this, I think at this point, there are about 220 paintings. I think I'm at about 260 now. And um, I was interested in this idea of nostalgia. I felt like in the recent times, a lot of people have been talking about, you know, the past, you had the way sort of, you know, make America great again, slogan, but this question of when things were great. And, and I started to think about loss and this idea of how can we, how can I make as an artist create a conversation that's very, very inclusive, that can, um, where anyone can take part. It doesn't really matter. You don't have to agree with me or my politics or anything, where it's just about this sort of human idea that we've all lost things that we love, that we all exist in a world that's changing rapidly. They're all things that from the past that, you know, we maybe wish hadn't disappeared or events that we wish hadn't happened. And uh, at this point I've got about, I had submissions from I think over 40 countries. And um, it's been very interesting because obviously the, you know, at the beginning, one of the biggest categories were happy childhood memories. I had tons of, you know, amusement parks, um, fantastic ones and not the great ones. Um, so quite a number of, of those sometimes amusement parks that people had gone to themselves. Sometimes they were ones they'd heard about from their pa parents or even their grandparents. Um, a lot of sort of happy sort of summer holiday memories. This is a park, um, this is a beach in Turkey that's now filled in, it's now a parking lot. Um, this woman wrote very movingly about going there as a, as a teenager. Um, this is a really interesting pool in Moscow that was built on the site after Stalin, um, destroyed the uh, Church of the Blessed Savior. He um, didn't have enough, he was gonna build a palace of the Soviets and didn't have enough um, steel. So Khrushchev ended up building the world's biggest outdoor pool. And then Putin demolished the pool and has rebuilt the, the cathedral on top of it. 
Um, so quite a lot of these places then end up being places that get destroyed for strange reasons. This is a, another pool in Margate. Um, this was an incredible pool. You can still see the ruins in um, San Francisco. The person who sent it in wrote um, rather sweetly about this idea that you, know, you could make something public um, for everyone that could be um, be so grand. And then, you know, there's a lot of interesting writing these days about um, you know this this idea that once, uh, especially in the states, once things become integrated, you start. Um, you know, the, the, the public swimming pools start being filled in, that you can't have public goods anymore because people um, don't want them to be integrated or didn't want them to be integrated, um, which I think is, is a very interesting kind of thing to think about. Um, sometimes they're just completely random things like in Milwaukee, this German sausage shop um, or this marketplace with all these little, um, stalls, the stalls were all cleared away as part of a sort of gentrification in Karachi. Um, somebody who wanted to go to this shoe shop in, that they'd gone to as a kid that were sad to discover it no longer existed. Um, some, some of the things that people sent in were actual artworks. Um, the gentleman who sent this in wrote very movingly about going to see house on what he considered to be the worst day of his life and how it had helped him. Um, some of them are not by famous artists. This is a, um, an outsider artist um, and his shell garden. Many of the places that people sent in are places that are really devoted just to having fun or a kind of fun, like casinos or um, football stadiums, or in this case, Flipper's Roller Boogie Palace, which I wish I could have gone to. Apparently it was amazing. Um, this is a famous LGBT um, bar in um, London that got demolished. And here's the bar, Mars Bar in New York, a famous uh, East Village dive or CBGBs, you know, um, or a sort of hat shaped restaurant in Los Angeles. Or somebody really missed something really silly like the, the tic tac toe chicken that you could play uh, tic tac toe with in Chinatown. Or Kim's video, they're places that now have disappeared in many cases because of technological change. So it's not just gentrification, um, it's also that, you know, um, these places that no longer have a function. Um, and some of them are so humble, like this little video store in some like village in England. I was wondering, like, you know, because it was, I was amazed we managed to find a photograph of it. Um, Drive-ins. And then there are, you know, air, this is the, the airport in Berlin um, that has now been, or, you know, so many kids sent in the Titanic. For some reason, this was very popular with children. Children always want to see things that they've heard about in school or sort of in popular culture and then are sad to hear that they don't exist anymore. The ferry. Um, a lot of people have been sending in nuclear power plants of late. I'm like up to four nuclear power plants. I'm not really sure why, but uh, people seem to miss those. And then architects, of course, send in lots of famous old buildings like um, Hotter's Maison du Peuple in Brussels or Bruskoff's Babinger House or this um, Frank Lloyd Wright Hotel in Tokyo, um, and the first Kunsthalle in um, Vienna. Um, this is a beautiful um, modernist, brutalist building in, in India. Um, and the Glasgow School of Art, which of course sadly burnt down. Um, and then people also sent in things that had disappeared a long, long time ago, where they had seen the ruins, but they wished they could have seen it in real life. This was from um, a Pakistani guy who lived near these ruins and wished he could see the city. Um, sometimes people had real personal experiences of, of loss. Um, in this case, um, this gentleman in, in the Canary Islands wrote very movingly about how, how beautiful these ravines with these bridges had been. They're all filled in and are highways now. And apparently all the poets used to meet here and drink and, and discuss new ideas, which sounds like a lot of fun. I wish I could have been there. Of course, you couldn't have something like this without Penn Station in New York, because um, that is really what started the whole, um, you know, without it, there wouldn't be any land, any um, landmarks being saved in New York. But then people also use the project to make, in many cases, um, you know, they're not so much about a, a sort of statement about the building, but about what they wish hadn't happened. So in this case, this is the Von Witt Teller building is rather famously where Trump Tower is today. And, you know, um, Trump, uh, bulldozed off the, near, the sort of the um, Art Deco freezes in the middle of the night after having promised to give them to um, the Met to save, save a penny. 
or in this case, um, these um, amazing earthworks in Benin were destroyed by the British in the punitive expedition um, in the 19th century. And at the same time when all the, those amazing Benin bronzes were looted. Um, ISIS has just destroyed a whole bunch of incredible places in Palmyra that um, a lot of people were mourning. And then of course, everyone knows about the Bamiyan Buddhas that the Taliban um, destroyed. We have, of course, the um, Twin Towers. This is a famous mosque that was um, destroyed in, in Yugoslavia in the conflict there. And in some cases, people are really sending in places that um, where it's, I don't know whether this person really missed the Pearl Monument so much as the fact that this was one of the sort of famous sites of the Arab Spring protests. Um, and this institute of, in, in Egypt, in Cairo, um, was a site place where it was burnt down by accident. And apparently the two sides which were clashing put aside their differences to try and rescue the manuscripts. Um, I've got a lot of synagogues, of course, a lot of beautiful old synagogues that were destroyed by the Nazis. This is one in Warsaw. Um, and also olive grove. I've recently started getting some olive groves in Palestine for people who, you know, I don't know if they miss the olive grove or if it's really, if, I think it's more of a um, statement about how they feel about the loss of that patrimony. Um, Hiroshima, of course, got in. Um, you've got, the, you've got this, one of the incredible casualties of World War II, St. Michael's and Dresden. In this case, the same person sent in both because um, the destruction of St. Michael's was used as an uh, excuse for the firebombing of Dresden. Um, and of course, one of the most famous lost sites is the, the temple in Jerusalem, got Troy. Um, some people sent in sites where, you know, it really, it really was about trying to elevate a, a narrative that they felt was missing or that needed to be told. So we have, you know, the tragic um, race massacre in um, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, this was the site of the um, Cherokee um, nation before they went on the Trail of Tears. And lastly, a lot of really sad places um, that have been victims of climate change and climate catastrophes. So this is the earthquake in um, Haiti. This is a glacier that just disappeared completely in 2009. This was the um, site of the Paradise Fire in California. Um, this is the Great Barrier Reef before it was bleached from icebergs. And then people often don't like things that have been improved. This is somebody who really wanted to see the, um, the High Line before it became what it is today. So what's been interesting for me is that this last couple of months, I spent a lot of time in this project is currently being shown in the Museum der Moderne in Salzburg. And it's been interesting with watching people interact with it. I spent quite a bit of time just sitting in the museum um, asking people for sites and continuing to paint. When I show it, I always show some of the paintings that are not finished to kind of indicate that things are missing and that people can add their own sites. And I've really enjoyed most of all collecting the stories. Um, if you look on the website, there's some incredible stories that people have written about their, the sites that they submitted. And just watching people stand in front of the piece kind of create, you know, discussing other people's stories, imagining what those stories might be, often uh, correcting me as to dates or various other things. But for me, it's been a tremendously gratifying project. And it's been one where as an artist, you know, it, does, it has really kind of come full circle to that question that I started with, which is what should you be doing as an artist? And I think that answer, the answer for that for every person is going to be incredibly personal. But for me, it really is about trying to create machines that build some kind of empathy, machines that complicate narratives, ways in which people can connect to each other through a kind of storytelling that is not necessarily a verbal story, but that can also be um, just an image. And so that's where I've ended up. Ellen, I'm so glad you answered your first question. I was going to ask you. <laughs> I you wish. Did. That was terrific. <laughs> it was really, uh, it was really great listening to you. I just have one one question that comes up with um, when I'm teaching. Um, when you did the the aerial view of Bruges that you said mm -hmm. was like the Google map, what was the virtue 
in not using the Google map, but transforming it into a painting. Because a lot of people would say, why don't you just use the photo? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, the reason I did is because if you just show the Google map, everyone's already got it. It's not, it's not special, it's not exciting. Um, there's a way in which if you make something by hand, each of those little marks is a part, you know, is, is me making a little mark. And it's the same way that if you, if you go and you see a hundred people all pointing up at something, everyone will go and look to see what it is. The same way that if you make something that is tremendously labor intensive, most people are much more likely to give it some time because they can see the amount of time that you put into it. But also I wanted it to be a painting because I wanted it to be, have a conversation with a different kind of painting, with this sort of very traditional kind of landscape painting of which there are innumerable examples of Bruges. So I was interested in this idea that, you know, what if you, if you made a painting of Bruges today, what should it look like? Um, and why, you know, and I like, I like things that, um, that mess with technology. So I don't, I think we have, we all have plenty of technology. We will have plenty of screens. What we don't necessarily have are weird versions of technology, non-functional, stupid, mad, useless versions. And that's what I like to produce. I totally enjoyed this. Um, for all of you watching, I met Ellen many, many years ago. Um, and that's part of my question at the at the Whitney program. I I I, I think you might have been there the year that, that Mark's sister Carrie was there as well, or maybe it was the year before or yeah. after. Yeah, exactly. Um so you know I I'll never forget sitting with Ron Clark during the um interview process and you came in and you know for anybody who knows the Whitney program it's very critically oriented. It's very much about um, institutional critique, all of these ideas. And, and you were sitting there as this painter, this, this you know, um, I guess you were also a renegade from the Yale Law School and all of this. <laughs> and I just remember you bewitching Ron, basically, <laughs> is the way I describe it. And what I've really loved watching is, and seeing in this, and it's part of the question, is how you you know, talk to talk to the students about the the experience of being in the Whitney program as a painter, a program that it, that it has had a, a a complicated background in terms of sometimes it hates painting, sometimes it doesn't. Um, it depends on where where it's at, and the way that your work is a kind of critical <gasps> practice, but not a critical practice in any didactic way. So. I know some students may not know what the independent study program is, but maybe if you want to describe it a little, describe going there, what what it was for you, if it was anything. Maybe it wasn't that important, um, but you have a very distinct practice. So anyway. Yeah, I think, I think for me, it was actually an incredibly helpful and supportive experience because I really was somebody who had, you know, had had always loved art, had always been obsessed with art, always wanted to be an artist. It hadn't seemed like it was feasible. Um, that wasn't something that was supported by my family um, at the time. And, and so it was something where it really was, it was sort of this moment in my life where I just decided, I was like, I'm going to be an artist. I just, I, I'm just gonna try. The worst that will happen is I'll, I'll have to get another job. You know, that's not, not the end of the world. Um, everyone has jobs. So, um, I mean, I didn't think of art being an artist necessarily as being a job. I think that's one of the reasons why this question of what it is to be an artist and how you, what should you be doing as an artist was the question that I think I entered the ISP with. And, and I was very interested, I was very, inter I mean, I was obsessed with utopias. I was very interested in all these larger structural things. And at the same time, I felt like, you know, I was making all these, you know, making wallpaper for the rich, like I was saying at the beginning. And I was trying to figure out, like, what can I do as an artist that marries all these different things together? And so, I mean, I remember at the time, I didn't, I've, I mean, I've done a lot of videos and a lot of other things. So I'm I've sort of, I didn't wish to take too long to show in, um, in this, in, in, a, you know, in a talk. But at the time, I remember during the Whitney, I was just like, 
well, I'm not going to do anything that's not painting because I'm just going to annoy Ron by just painting exactly. the whole time. And that wasn't very <laughs> good. That was a good one. But, <laughs> but then the moment I left, I was like, okay, now I'm going to experiment a whole bunch. Um, but I, I really spent that whole year thinking a lot about um, kind of, you know, the sort of structures that um, of the art market, of the art world, where I, what I was interested in doing, like what, what motivated me to be an artist, because it wasn't a given to me that I was going to just be an artist. Um, so I really, I found it to be a, a wonderful experience. I'm still very close friends with a lot of people from that time. Yeah. And, um, and just, you know, all those kind of conversations. Um, I think that as an artist, um, you really do need people to bounce off of, you know, you need people with whom you can really um, bear your soul because also you're going to have the dark night of the soul yourself. You know, this is a, there are always moments, every artwork that you create, at least for me, is haunted by the ghost of, you know, the better artwork that I could have made if I were, you know, smarter, had thought it out better, had more resources at that moment, um, more time. So, you know, there's that. You know, I think I think you you need people in your corner, and you need people who will challenge you. And for me, that was a really um, important moment. Also, because at the time, mm -hmm. I didn't want to go back to school because I, I just I just got out of debt. So, <laughs> well, it's just magnificent to see where where you've gone with it, and how how rich and how big your practice is. You also I, you also did a I mean one portrait that you sold a million years ago where we all made funny faces. Mm -hmm. and you painted those I remember that one that was the year of that that I was the instructor at the Whitney program anyway welcome and lovely to see you it was a lovely it was a lovely time I have very fond memories of it so when exactly was that um period for you um in terms of like that kind of like experimental phase and you were asking those like more personal questions was it sort of before you started getting those larger projects or was it like during that period as well? I don't think it's ever stopped actually. I still, I still feel like, I mean, I think that one of the, um, I mean, there are ways in which that, you know, I think it, it depends what kind of artist you are, right? Some people really are like, they're like Morandi. They have like one thing and they love that thing and they do it and they're just like, they're just so happy and amazing. And I, I've always wanted to be that kind of artist where you're like, this is what I do but that's not the kind of artist I am. I'm much more of a grasshopper. So I tend to be like, oh, this is so interesting. I'm gonna do this now. Or, oh, you know, now I've seen this thing and suddenly I want to make a piece that's about that. So I tend to circle around a lot of these same questions. I think that's, you know, that's why, you know, you can kind of tell from the, from, you know, the sort of overview. And so I tend to, you know, I still, I still, you know, I still spend ages thinking about each project before I do it. I still, you know, try to interrogate myself to say, well, is this really the best thing I can do? Is this the best use of my time, of my resources right now? Should I make this thing or should I make this other thing? Um, so I, I, I never feel like I've come to any real conclusion. Um, yeah, so, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to keep painting disappointed tourists for the next, um, you know, two years I decided, but I'm already starting other projects and they'll be completely different. So I, I just, I just like, um, I, know, I like falling in love with an idea or, you know, asking a completely dumb question and then seeing what happens. And, uh, you know, that, that to me, you know, I think we need to ask more stupid questions. We're always asking these sort of serious questions, but maybe we should need to ask more stupid questions and we would have some better answers, you know. Or maybe we just accept that there aren't any really good answers and that, that there's more than one answer, you know, and that's, um, that's okay. Um, I think people, people want these simple narratives, but in fact, I'm, I'm very anti-simple narratives. I like messy sort of narratives that spill out all over the place where you think, okay, I, I got it. And then you're like, no, I didn't get it too. Because I think that's what life is like. And I think that's something that, um, you know, it's just, I don't need to see another, I, I love superhero movies, but I don't need to see another superhero movie. I want to like make something that's, that's sort of complicated and that collapses and is a failure. And because that's, I think, I think that's really my, my area of expertise, is failing at things. <laughs> we have a question from the chat that I might read to you. It's from 
Thank you for your wonderful presentation. Looking at your projects, they appear to be completely out of the painting. Um, and on the other hand, completely rooted in painting. By which I think Sangho means like, on one hand, they have not much to do with painting. And on the other hand, they're completely rooted, rooted in painting. And it is interesting that they are very beautiful. As a painter and as an SVA student, I accept and ex experiment with many things and seek various directions. However, I also try to develop my identity as a painter, though I'm not obsessed with it in any direction. And so to develop my identity as a painter in any direction and try to make it fit the grammar of the contemporary art scene. My question is, the contemporary art scene is overflowing with art from many genres. From the student's point of view, this is welcome, but also very confusing. Where in the world should we be influenced? How to discern what is good art and how should my art pave the way and develop in this complex art market or art world? That is a really hard question. <laughs> That's a really difficult question. And I mean, I, I love painting. I've, I've always had this like sort of, you know, it's delicious, it's fun. It's fun to make paintings. I love looking at paintings. Um, and, and yet, yet they're also really interesting, like intellectually paintings, because if you think about it, like paintings don't do any of the things that paintings originally did. Like you don't use them to represent like, you know, if you fall in love, you're not like, oh, oh, please make me a painting of my love. And like, you know, you're gonna have a photograph, you know, or if you wanna see something amazing, you go to the movie theaters, you don't go to see some big painted panorama. Um, or some John Martin painting. So a lot of the things that painting used to do, other technologies of representation have taken it over. So painting kind of exists as this weird vestigial thing that's really a, an art signifier. It's like you make a painting, people are like, oh, it's art, right? It, it couldn't be anything else. What else could it be? It's a painting, it has to be art. So in some ways that's kind of awesome. Like when you make a painting, it's automatically art. So at the same time, that's also a huge burden. And it's very difficult. So I, I really feel for you because I feel exactly the same way. I don't. I don't have an answer. I, I don't. I fall in love with so many different kinds of art and so many different art practices. And I enjoy lots of things that are nothing like the things that I make. In fact, I enjoy those things most of all because my own things that are closer to my own work. I'm, I obviously like are much more sort of emotionally trying. Um, so I, I think that it, it is really about personally thinking about what it is that you have to say or what you want to what you want to sort of show the world or what you, you know, we live in a world where most speech is dominated by corporations. Um, you know, there's not there's not that much space. And yet at the same time, we're also in a world where as a you know, because of some of, some of the technological changes, you can have more of a voice as a person. And so I think that it's it's really about thinking about how, what you want to say, how you want to say it. And art in some ways is a kind of nonverbal saying. So it's about trying to make objects or things or experiences for people. And, you know, for me, it's about trying to create a space for conversation and to seduce people into having new thoughts. That's my answer, but is that your answer? I don't know. You are, your answer could be completely different. You might say, well, I just want to make something that's beautiful for people, or, or maybe, you know, I just want to express something that I have to express. Everyone has their own answer for this. Um, or, or if you're like me, you never have a satisfactory answer. You just kind of oscillate from, from answer to answer to answer to question back and forth again. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Ellen. I love that um, a phrase that just um, that you just uttered, seduce people into having new thoughts. Um, seduce people into thinking new thoughts. I wonder if that's a bit of a clue into why you continue so insistently to paint um, because of the seductiveness of painting and its special history. Well, I think it's 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 something that exists for most you know it's it's exists for pleasure right it doesn't have any use and I think I love that about it like I love and I think there's also something where a lot of people feel quite confident um especially with representational painting 
um, where people feel like, oh, you know, I, I can have an opinion about this. I can relate to this. So, you know, with the disappointed tourists, like I'm not worried that people are going to be, you know, they're not going to be sort of, you know, it's, it's a large conceptual piece, but it's also a huge, you know, like hundred foot painting. And, um, and there's a way in which it's, you know, the fact that it's made by hand, the fact that somebody painted it, that it has all this sort of hand painted lettering, um, it looks like an old, look, they look like old postcards, but they're also sort of, you know, they're tactile. They're something that people, people spend time with them. They don't just go and, and look at them. And I think that there is something about, um, yeah, I, I do think there's something about the sort of handmade object that is different. And yet at the same time, that doesn't mean that I'm, you know, I don't love art that doesn't use that. It just happens to be what I'm good at. Like I, I find it easy to paint, like I enjoy painting. And that's sort of my skill set. And so it's one of the things that I like to do because I know, I know that when you make a painting, people react to it in a particular way. And I can use that to kind of create a very welcoming space for people um, where they can feel like you're there included. Um, and, and that really comes out of that first project. That really comes out of the beautification project where I, I really spent, you know, sort of spending a couple of years painting on the streets, talking to people about painting was for me incredibly informative and helpful. You know, it made me really think about, about well, you know, always people have opinions about what I should be doing as an artist, you know, um, maybe I should do some of those things. And, and I, you know, went off and tried to do some of them. Um, and yeah, there's, there's something about, um, and there's something about the sort of, it's, it's quite, it's also not that expensive to make a painting. That's also quite nice. Um, some of those sort of large public art projects are much more, you know, I, I couldn't do them unless I was commissioned. Whereas I can just sort of set off and be like, well, I'm going to make several hundred paintings. I can, I can do that. <laughs> but it's like very grand, you know, it's very big and like, you know, impressive to people. So, and then people do spend time with it, you know, in a way that I think that if I had just, you know, blown up photographs of all of those places, it would be a very different project. It wouldn't be quite as romantic. It wouldn't have the nostalgic feel. And, and you know, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in this question of, of nostalgia. Is nostalgia inevitably reactionary? Like I'm interested in things that seem like they should be, that most people sort of, you tend to think, oh, well, that's like very reactionary. And then you think, well, but what if you, if you look at it again, or if you change the, the sort of the frame, could it be different? I don't know the answer really, but uh, I, um, I like experimenting. Um, a question kind of technically regarding the postcard series, and you might have mentioned this briefly, I, I'm not sure, but are they all the, the forgotten places, postcard memories, where you'd want to go? Are they all places that have to have a corresponding photograph or are actually like re remembered collectively? because like my answer would be like this tree house I built when I was a kid, mm -hmm. you know, that's now torn down because of developmental housing. Would it be the developmental housing that would be the painting? No, or would no, it be I would the tree house? I would paint the tree house. So, so in most cases, um, there's some kind of image that somebody has, but in some cases, you know, the image is like, they're like, well, I can kind of describe it and then I'll try to make a painting based on a description. Um, so it depends, you know, if it's something, if it's like a particular house and there's no image of it, then I probably can't do it. Like a tree house, if you did me a sketch of the tree house, then I might be able to paint the tree house. Um, so I need something that, you know, to, to base the painting on. But, you know, sometimes, it, you know, I'm, I'm painting like the space under somebody's like um, grandmother's kitchen table right now. So, you know, some, some of them are, um, or, or somebody sent me in the world before plastic was invented. Um, so some of them, are, you know, are just a much more kind of like, I'm just going to make stuff up, but other ones, there's an actual image. Um, but if, it, if it, you know, if you need, if the place needs to be recognizable in some way to the part, you know, to, so that, um, so I need something to go on. Are any of those like, uh, do you prefer painting the ones that have references or literal references, or do you have a preference painting the more imaginative ones? Where do you get out of uh, either of them? I don't know. Like in some ways, the ones that I love the most are the ones that are super personal and weird. Like, and, and you're just like, why is this thing so important to this person? Um, 
and you know and then although but then I also sometimes it's also fun when, when you have a beautiful image and you're like oh I'm going to paint this thing that's going to be really interesting to paint and sometimes I, you know like one of them is some of them are really interesting intellectually or emotionally but then the paintings turn out to be rubbish you know you, you painted it and you're like oh this is really not the best painting I, I don't know what happened here um so it, it kind of varies it, you know you it's sort of a it's a bit of a mishmash because sometimes you have a great image and then you still manage to make a terrible painting and other times you know you have a terrible image like there's this one like Lord of the Rings themed restaurant that this person had like one super blurry photograph of and I painted it and then, then it became this beautiful painting. And I was like, wow, this is so cool. This painting is awesome. Um, and other times you get some amazing image and then you make the painting and you just think, God, this painting is really rubbish. Um, so it's kind of hard to know. It's like a bit of a, it's a bit of a, um, an adventure each time. And it's also, I mean, it was a great project to do during the pandemic because you know, I was having all these conversations with all these people all over the world who were sending in things. Um, and uh, at a time when none of us could go anywhere. So it's, there's a kind of very personal part of I me. Mean, it's, it's quite fun for me. Um, and it's also very relaxing because there's nothing so nice as being told what to do as an artist sometimes. You know, all those anxieties that you have about what you should be doing, if other people just tell you what to do, then you think, oh God, this is great. At least one person in the world will be happy with this, you know, so. <laughs> But often they're sites Very that nice. more than one person loves. So then you have, you know, you have a whole bunch of fans of a particular site. Um, and uh, that, that's kind of, it's sort of interesting how a lot of these places are social. I mean, they're almost all social sites. Um, not all of them, but most of them are places that a lot of people care about. But every now and then that's you just get some weird outlier. Yeah. Sylvia. I like that. Go ahead, sorry. Like I like that a lot. And I, this isn't a question, but a, just a reflection that I think is worth mentioning. There was a earlier question that began the presentation is this street art. And I think I largely gauge street art by it's like generosity to the community, not necessarily like being for it, but like just how it's something given to the community. And I think that I, it's remarkable the way you've turned painting into a personal endeavor of your own, so a personal thing. And I, I think it's really beautiful that it's very much, even if it's one person at a time, you're still giving, giving, giving. I think that's nice. Oh, well, thank you. Um, it's actually a bit of a problem now because now I've made all these paintings and I'm still going on. So I'm gonna probably end up with about 500 of them. And the real question is, what do I do with them all? <laughs> and, uh, I can't decide, like, do I keep them together? Do I give them away? I'm not sure I can afford to give them away. So it's a, it's a you know, again, it's, it's, it's a, you know, people who, who took part, they also, they all get a, get a print of their painting. Um, but the question, you know, sort of what happens to the actual paintings? You know, some projects I've made have involved giving away physical paintings or physical artworks and other, you know, but it all depends on, you know, whether I can do that at that moment, so. But yeah, I think that I think the idea of of wanting to make art for other people is is kind of a, it's kind of a magical moment when you realize it doesn't have to all be about you. There is an interesting balancing act that we perform as artists between generosity and selfishness. Um, and I think it can be. Um, can be very generous. Um, what is the print given away? I guess, like what kind of, yeah, how is it made? And I would just ask related to that and maybe you can answer both at the same time is, um, would you consider selling the paintings? And if so, to whom? And perhaps, you know, only as a set or, you know, uh, individually, would you sell them in, in, in batches to you know, anyone, any institution or country who wanted to buy them or would you interested, be interested in selling them back to the people who commissioned them in a way? It's a huge problem. I, 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 need, I need help with this issue because um, yeah, I mean the same with, um, the same way that when I was doing the portraits on the street and I gave them to people, I was like, I'm just giving away these things. And then when I did it inside the Whitney Museum, it became a huge problem because more people wanted to have portraits than could be accommodated. So instead of be giving something away, it became about denying people 
<laughs> who wanted portraits because I couldn't do them all. So in this case, the project only really makes sense as a collective. So I don't think I can separate them individually. Um, so what I've decided to do is that I'm, I'm having Gicle prints made. If you want a version of your portrait um, of your painting, you can get um, a print made at cost of it. And you also get, get the image. And so you can have that. Um, but I haven't decided, you know, I, I mean, honestly, like probably no one's gonna want this project. I mean, who knows, maybe I'll be lucky, but uh, it's quite large. So we'll see, I have to, I have to figure out what I'm gonna do. I, I'm, um, right now it's just traveling around and, and getting bigger every time I show it. So it started off in Milwaukee and then it went to, to the UK and then it's in Austria and then now it's going to Poland in April. Um, and then I think it's coming back, um, Poland will be interesting. And uh, then it's coming back to the US, I think. So I, I, I honestly don't know. Um, you know it, it definitely was a project that I started um, without having a clear understanding of what I would end up with. Um, Are they watercolor or ink or acrylic wash? Um, they're acrylic and oil. So they're acrylic underpainting with oil on top. On some kind of special paper? No, they're on panels. So, oh, I see. So they're on, on gesso board, gesso panels. Mm. And then do you photograph them or scan them? Like, do you have like a copy stand set up in your studio and you have it all worked out and no, sort of like an assembly line, like for e-commerce? <laughs> no, I just photo I have them photographed. I see, yeah. So I sort of take good photographs of them. Um, and, uh, yeah, they, 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 they print very, they print very nicely. They okay. make good t-shirts too. I made some t-shirts for some people for Christmas. <laughs> Suzanne Jolson has a question, which is almost a suggestion. Would you sell them to people who wrote an explanation about why they wanted them? Well, interesting you say that because that is what I'm currently dealing with because people are starting to write to me um, and then it becomes really problematic um, because it turns out that, you know, you have like the the daughter of the people who owned a particular pub and then the owners of the pub and, and people start writing to you with these very sort of elaborate reasons why they should be allowed to buy this painting. And um, because these are all sites that people care about. So it's not just the person who submitted it. Often, often there's quite a lot of other people who love this site. Like it turns out that like, you know, the Roller Boogie Palace is just beloved by a ton of people. Or like, you know, you uh, and so, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm starting to get more and more of these very kind of heartfelt emails and I'm not quite sure what to do about it. And I have so far not asked my gallerists because I feel like I have to, I have to like come up with a, a decision of my own. Um, but I haven't come up with one because I'm not quite sure what the right thing to do is. Um, because I don't, because I feel like if you take away CBGBs, that's very sad you know, then you don't have it in the in the piece. So I've decided I'm not selling any until the piece has stopped moving and has finished in any case. And then I will, and then I will, um, unless, unless I totally run out of money, in which case I might have to sell some of them, <laughs> wow. which might happen. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Gregory says, sell for fundraising for worthy project, nonprofit, or, <laughs> and I would just add, you know, for me, I, well, I think I about the ethics of these things a lot. I, for my two cents, for what it's worth, since I have the mic, is that um, yeah, go for it. you would be well, you would be on very solid ethical ground, I think, to sell them and not just at cost, because there are lots of other costs uh, involved in being an artist and just, you know, what it takes to, you know, the, the ink or the, you know, what the, what the printer charges you. Uh, in the paper. Um, but then, you know, of course, you could also replace the ones in the exhibition, I suppose, with prints or, you know, sell them now and agree to distribute them later. But um, but let's move on. Um, <laughs> no, uh, no, I, I mean, I would definitely need to, I definitely need to pay myself as well. So, <laughs> I think so. But, uh, but in this case, you know, but I think that people who took part in it, you can, they get, they get the printed cost. So that, that's, yeah, uh, okay. that's, so that sort of cost, which involves a little, like, a little compensation for my time as well in making it, but mm -hmm. they can get that you get the printed cost um, if yeah. you if you took part in it. But everyone I mean, else, they, it's a it's a different situation. But they can you're, get you're, you're not you're nowhere near Damien Hurst territory here. 
Uh, there's nothing no. mercenary about your practice um, <laughs> by any means. Um, you're getting more and more suggestions in the chat. Have someone buy a building with many floors, then people could visit. I love the idea of a museum of paintings of places that no longer exist. Well, with the too. stories, <laughs> gathering and talking. But of course, there's also a book um, that I'm sure you will end up making with this project. Um, Sylvia, would you like finally to speak your question? Be nice to hear it from you, if you're willing. Hi, um, I wanted to know about your experience in the New York art scene because you use a very traditional media in a figurative way. Was it like difficult to be taken seriously as a contemporary artist because of that? Um, She's particularly interested when you first emerged yeah. as an artist. Uh, I think that I way. was, I was, I think I was incredibly lucky is, is all I can say is that um, I, I, I'm not really even sure how I was, I, I was, I was kind of socially relentless at that point um, and probably more charming than I am now. But um, I was very, I went to see, I mean, I went to see everything. I talked to everyone. Um, and I was very, I mean, I was very, I was very concept, I mean, conceptually motivated. So I don't think that um, the fact that I was making paintings or representational paintings was really a big issue at the time. Um, it, I mean, I think right now actually is a much is a much more sort of flowering, flourishing time for painting than it was back then. But there are always people who've made paintings, and um, and I think that my my interest in in kind of old fashioned aesthetics is one that I mean maybe it's not one that that was shared by that many people, but at least it was my my interest. It was a thing that I cared about. So I think that if you're if there's if you're something that you desperately care about and desperately interested in, other people will think it's interesting too most of the time, or maybe not not that many of them, but maybe enough of them will. Um, so that I mean, there's nothing like somebody who's truly obsessed with something um, to make other people interested. And I, I think that you know if it's if it's genuinely the thing that you care about there'll be somebody out there who will care about it too. Um, or at least, at least in, in, if nobody does care about it, at least you'll be doing the thing that you care about, that matters to you. And, uh, and that's a large part of, you know, of having a, having a happy life in a way, having, meaning, having a meaningful life. So I, 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 don't, I think that I didn't, I didn't find that to be particularly problematic um, just because, yeah, I didn't want to be doing exactly what everyone else was doing anyway. So I, I wanted to do the things that, that, that spoke to me. You really did enter the art world. It was around the same time I did, I think. And, yeah. you, know, you know, art in both our educations and what was going on, things were really very different. Like the idea that the Whitney Independent Study Program, which was so steeped in um, sort of post-Marxist and post-structuralist theory, um, was considered so important is almost impossible to imagine now. Um, yeah. And the influence that those, you know, discourses and bodies of theory had and the overall anti-market and anti-painting sentiment um, are just a distant memory. You should paint that because those have <laughs> disappeared. Uh, paint theory, please. Um, Hi. You can just go, you just, you know, go to www.disappointedtourist.org and you can just see it. <laughs> Um, I'm getting more and more weird abstract suggestions of late. So, you know, all right. while it was all climate change related, and now it's like, you know, somebody just sent in their mother's womb. Yeah, like, the future, hey. it's disappeared. Okay. <laughs> oh, is it? Hello. Um, yes, I would like to ask a question. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, I actually wanted to go back to the beginning of your presentation. Um, and oops, I was just wondering. Because I guess you started with um, asking the question, like, what is, like, who is an artist, or what, like, how can one call themselves an artist? Like, who's entitled to use this um, definition? Yeah. And I guess you already said that you didn't come to a conclusion, um, but I was wondering if you figured out some codes or some characteristics <laughs> or like where you think okay this is an artist for me or do you think 
do you kind of follow maybe like Joseph Boy's definition of an artist that everyone is an artist or I don't know yeah I think I'm more of a yeah I would I would be I would be with Boyce in the sense that I think that everyone is an artist but I think not everyone claims being an artist and okay. I think it's something you have to claim I think you have to you know there's it, there's a way in which it's a very privileged position to be able to claim that you are an artist that what you have to say what you have to show matters and that people should pay attention to it and I think that's actually I mean on the one hand it's quite it's it's quite difficult because you of course there are moments you think well why should you listen to me like why am I the person why why what I'm saying is it, is it actually important I, I don't know um so I think every every if you're honest you often doubt whether you are an artist Mm. um I think that um or you doubt I mean I often think well what's the point of being an artist like why am I doing this mm. and yet at the same time it's the thing that I'm called to do you know I, I there is a way in which this is this is this is the the meaning of my life you know this is what I care about um I love making art I love seeing people interact with art I love um I like physically making things that didn't exist before. I like this idea of that I can be like, well, you know, I can make something special for a place or for a group of people, or I can make some experience or, you know, or just even like a, a kind of lovely thing that didn't previously exist. Um, mm -hmm. so, I, so I think there's, I think it's really, I don't think there is really a good answer. I do think that everyone can be an artist. And I think that the art world has a lot of totally unnecessary and stupid and class-based and resource-based barriers to entry for people to be artists. Um, I think there are a lot of stupid gatekeepers in the art world that I think, you know, there are ways in which artists are treated as being very special by some people and at the same time they also be treated as though you're a complete idiot a lot of the time. I think one of the reasons artists are allowed to be transgressive is because like children, people don't take artists very seriously. You know, you're kind of you're you're allowed to do bad things because it doesn't really matter. Um, so you know, it's 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 a it's an interesting kind of court jester like um, kind of social space in our society, and I think you can do a lot of interesting things in that social space. And what you make of it is going to be what you want to make of it. Um, you know, you can't. You know, it's not like there's a little piece of paper that you can you can you can you know you can do your you can have as many degrees as you like, but it's not a piece of paper that's going to persuade people that you are an artist. It's going to be you. You're going to be the person who has to say, well, I'm an artist. And and you're going to, you know, I remember, you, you know, I remember practicing saying it in the mirror. Because <laughs> I seemed so ludicrous. I was just like, well, no one's going to believe me. <laughs> so it's I think a bit there's- a two-step, I think. I think. Like, yeah. It's a bit of a two-step where you, you assert that, that you're an artist or something you've made is art. And then uh, that sort of completed by it's being recognized as such, um, especially by by people who are deemed to have the, you know, the institutional authority to do so. You know, a curator or someone like that. Um, At the same time, you you could make something that doesn't get that good housekeeping stamp of approval, and it could still be art, and you could still oh, be absolutely, thinking, and yeah. you could still think that was the best piece of art you ever made. You know, some places and that's that's uh yeah that, that you know you're trying to create a kind of social consensus but at the same time like maybe it doesn't matter if that social consensus doesn't happen i don't know the um the fact that you instead of you know getting a, a master's of fine arts degree got a juris doctor um from a law school to me seems typically perverse although maybe it was <laughs> maybe there are other reasons i mean every with, with every project you're sort of trying to do in a certain sense to undermine some, something. Um, but um, it reminds me of a, of a, I don't know if it's even, if it's like a, an apocryphal story, if it's a myth, but apparently there was a graduate student at maybe one of the UC schools, maybe it was Davis, who had to defend their thesis. And um, they were, you know, prankster-ish conceptual artists. And what they did was, um, is hire a lawyer to come with them. And the lawyer responded to all of the questions and defended the work. And the work was, in fact, inviting the lawyer to defend <laughs> their doctoral dissertation. Uh, I mean, their, their master's thesis. Um, but, um, but on the question of uh, jeder, jeder Mensch ein Künstler or jeder Mann ein Künstler, um, which is also sometimes just translated almost ungrammatically as everyone an artist or yeah. every man an artist. 
Um, I found, I just did a quick Google because I, I, I'm a big, I've been influenced a lot by Boyce's thinking on social sculpture. And what, what he meant, I believe, was not that everyone today is an artist, but that it, in, in a, a, a utopian revolutionary cult society, we would all together be able to be artists in the medium of society, reworking society so that we're truly free. It's, it's a kind of, you know, it's not a communist utopia, it's this other kind of thing. And, you know, as many of you know, he was one of the founders of the Green Party in Germany um, and, you know, was fired from his important professorship position. Um, was it Dusseldorf? Yeah. Anyway, very radical dude, but he's not saying that every single bureaucrat today and every person who's just a mindless consumer um, is an artist, but that in a, in a revolutionary society, all we could all be artists that a revolutionary story might in a certain sense require that everyone act as a social sculptor. Well, I think the German sort of implies this, like, this sort of aspirational kind of side of it. And I think that's, um, you know, you, you kind of, it, when you say Jedermann and Künstler, it, does, it's, it doesn't mean that, yeah, it doesn't mean that everyone is, because, because you don't have everyone is an artist. It's, it's every man an artist. So it has this sort of space between the two. Well, Ellen, thank you so much. It it's was been wonderful to hear you speak at some greater length about your work. It was and um, I can tell from just how active the conversation was, sort of the sidebar conversation in the chat, that you know we everyone else was as engaged and enthralled and impressed as as I was. So I look forward to, um, I'm sure many of our students look forward to your studio visits when they happen. Um, yeah, I'm coming a little later because I, I have to admit, I, I really hate giving um, talks over Zoom. <laughs> so I was really happy to talk to you all, but of course it's just such a weird experience where you're just talking to your own screen. Um, and as a result, I always feel like it, I make a complete dog's dinner of it, but I would, I'm looking forward to actually meeting you in person um, and seeing your works in person. Um, and I believe that's gonna be in March or April. So I do hope you'll sign up. And if any of you have places that you would like to visit that don't exist anymore, um, please feel free to send them to me also. Um, I'm always excited to get new suggestions. And, um, and thank you so much for inviting me. It was a pleasure. <laughs>